بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Excellencies, friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The title of tonight's lecture, The Great German Poet, Goethe. Why did he consider himself to be a Muslim? This is an interesting and intriguing topic. Highly, even hotly debated subject matter, Goethe's involvement with Islam has been considered by many scholars and poets, including the Muslim poet Muhammad Iqbal and the late Anne-Marie Shemel, who was a dear friend of Dar al-Athar Islamiya and a participant in the cultural activities of the Dar, both locally and internationally. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe lived in one of the most vibrant and exciting periods of German history. He was one of the key figures of German literature and the movement of uh, Weimar classicism in the late 18th and 19th centuries. And his work spanned the fields of poetry, drama, literature, theology, humanism, and science. Intensely interested in world literatures, he had a special affinity for Oriental works, and he explored both pre-Islamic poetry and the Holy Quran. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Manfred Austin, is himself, like Goethe, a man of many interests and abilities. His career, in fact, has many parallels with Goethe. At, univers at university, Dr. Austin received his first degree in law, philosophy, music, and literature. He later joined the diplomatic service and as you can see by the handout you received at the door, has received many awards and honorary doctorates in addition to his own doctor degree at Cologne University. Another example of his many faceted career is that he is an accomplished musician playing viola in concerts in Australia, Germany, and Japan. Nevertheless, for all the expertise of Goethe's exhibited, he had exhibited in many fields, he never used a mobile phone. <laughs> For all we know that we depend on them today, he managed to amass an extraordinary amount of information without one. And we hope that you do the same tonight. So please, make sure you turn off your mobile phones and let's welcome Dr. Manfred Austin. Ja, Hatrati al Sheikha, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for these wonderful introductory remarks as far as Goethe is concerned, and the flattering remarks concerning myself, and uh, which reminded me of Oscar Wilde, who said, When it comes to modesty, only few will equal me. <laughs> <laughs> so, please uh, don't believe all these uh, flattering remarks. Uh, and in particular, I would like to start with an Arab sentence uh, which says, Ashkurukum min kuli kolben. That's to say, I want to, uh, to express my most sincere gratitude for the generous opportunity to lecture tonight here in Kuwait on Goethe. Uh, on, because the religious and cultural and historic roots of this uh, uh, country and this region were of extraordinary interest and uh, attractivity for Goethe himself. And therefore, I would like to introduce to you, first of all, Goethe himself, as far as his portrait is concerned. Perhaps we could just switch to the portrait uh, it will come up. Anyway, the very, f the very first portrait you will see is Goethe's portrait uh, it, when he was in his 60s, the time when he uh, started his powerful poetry called the West Eastern Divan. I'll concentrate on this, of course, tonight. And as I should perhaps add uh, to 
Mr. President's remarks, Goethe was born in Frankfurt am Main in 1749, and when he died in Weimar, a small city in the eastern part of Germany, uh, at the age, uh, in 1832, he had established indeed what we call the classical Weimar period of German literature together with his friend Frederick Schiller. One of the characteristics of this period, among others, was Goethe's exceptional endeavor to set up an international virtual forum in order to encourage a permanent dialogue between German literature and the most prominent emanations of poetry and literature from other countries. In order to counterbalance narrow-minded chauvinistic tendencies prevalent in Germany in the 19th century, Goethe in this context focused in particular on the literature of the Islamic Oriental world with extraordinary empathy for many years. And many artists again and again tried to generate half ironically portraits of Goethe uh, showing him as a member of the Oriental world. And this picture you just see here is one of these pictures. And it's interesting to see that he is just reading a very famous uh, Arab book, which I think in your own language says, Alf Laila wa Laila. So the hundred and thousand uh, nights. And uh, it is one of the books, of course, Goethe himself uh, largely interpreted and uh, adored uh, for, the, for the end of his life. And many of the many parts of these books were in, uh, in, introduced by him into his famous uh, drama, Faust, even. The poetic result of Goethe's oriental endeavors, of course, is universal poetry. That's to say, Goethe's personal dialogue with the Orient resulted in a sublime masterpiece of poetry known as West Eastern Divan, West Östlicher Divan, as it is pronounced in German. And I'll concentrate on this masterpiece tonight and, of course, on its commentary called Notes and Reflections for a Better Understanding of the West Eastern Divan. And one of the pictures, which will alternate here, shows uh, the draft, Goethe's own draft of this masterpiece, the West Eastern Divan, with Goethe's own exercises, uh, own uh, ex example of his own exercises of Arab script. Uh, and uh, you will certainly read what he uh, is, uh, did write here. I'm not quite sure whether he was really aware of the uh, importance of what he wrote in this, uh, uh, when he wrote this, uh, uh, this part of uh, Arab script in his uh, draft of the West Eastern Divan, because it refers to uh, Ali as the grandson of Muhammad. In Germany, it has rarely been noted that Goethe's brilliant work of poetry, the West Eastern Divan, which was published in 1819, can be considered to be a personal testimony of his admiration for the history culture and religion of the Oriental world. Here, in the Oriental culture, Goethe encounters an unexpected positive phenomenon. And this is very important for the rest of the evening. He recognizes 
a general refusal, due to religious reasons, of those negative, over-hasty tendencies of Western European, Europe, which Goethe himself considered to be, quote, the most lamentable disaster of our time, consuming in the next moment the moment that has just passed, unquote. Uh, a quotation Goethe wrote to one of his relatives in Berlin in 1825. Three years later, in 1828, in a conversation with his note-taker, Eckermann, Goethe expressed his feelings of aversion against these over-hasty tendencies of Western Europe, saying, quote, we old Europeans, by the way, are not at all well. Our conditions are too artificial and complicated. Our food and way of living lack appropriate nature and our social dealings are lacking in proper love and goodwill." Unquote. Similar ideas had already been expressed by Goethe's friend, the famous explorer of Latin America, Alexander von Humboldt, who during his voyages in Latin America confided to his diary in March 1801, quote, I was extremely impatient putting those thousands of questions to the native Indian regarding the way I had lost. The Indian, however, did not answer at all. He continued to look at a tree motionlessly and he showed me as if nothing had ever happened. A fat iguana slipping from branch to branch. This Indian apparently lives outside of space and time, while we Europeans seem intolerable to him, restless beings possessed by demons." Unquote. All this leads to the question, what actually are those restless European demons that were already frightening Goethe at the beginning of the 19th century. To Goethe, Europe was increasingly evolving into a velociferous world, driven by progress and future, future-oriented demons. The word velociferous in this context is very important and it is Goethe's very own denomination for the modern self-destructive linkage, linkage between velocitas, the Latin word for velocity and haste, and Lucifer, the devil. And I presume that Goethe would have been delighted to know that there is a correspondent proverb in existing in Arab language, uh, which says, Allagili min ashaitan. The devil and the haste is combined in this proverb, uh, and I think there are very often these remarks in your own language uh, to slow down, which means I understood shoe, shoe, or mechlen, mechlen. Uh, Goethe would have been pleased to know that these expressions do have such an importance in your own language. Goethe's uh, drama Faust can therefore be considered to be a metaphoric tragedy of this very modern interdependency of Velocitas and Lucifer. Because here, Mephisto as Lucifer tempts Faust with all those velociferous devices of modernity, such as fast 
weapons, fast transportation, and the virtual money of today's worldwide financial crisis, all of which drives the impatient Faust into fatal illusions, disaster, and self-destruction. Uh, arriving here, by the way, in Kuwait, uh, on one of your highways, we noted the remark, speed leads to death, which is very interesting to see. To go to the vociferous tendencies in Europe even posed a threat to the last and most spiritual bastion to language. Long before Hugo von Hofmannsthal, epoch-making letter to Lord Chandos, Goethe had already poetically expressed a profound language skepticism a fear of the loss of language and of the expulsion from the paradise of confidence in language. He feared that even words would be affected and seized by the impatient, vociferous role of his time. That words would disappear in the modern noise of awkward, lawful, and idle talk of an inhumane language. Driven by impatience, we would be left with a language which was already well on its way to accelerating itself, the sense of degenerating into mere information, into information as a linguistic failure. The result of this would be that our language would no longer match and reflect human experience. And language corrupted by political lies and the vulgarity of mass conception would turn into an instrument of bestiality. Goethe described this dangerous process by saying, quote, how unsettled I feel by the dubious trades of awkward, idle talk, where nothing persists and everything flees, where already gone is what you see, and it embraces me, this frightening, gray-knitted web." Unquote. At the end of the 20th century, the German author Boto Strauss summed up this interdependency of haste and empty talk in a modern vision, saying, quote, the, air, the air around us seems to be filled with the almost audible howling of a monstrous wave of empty talk racing around the world at an incredible speed. One could say, velociferous speed. Summarizing, one could say that for Goethe, the history, cultural, and religion of the Oriental world occurred as the real antithesis of all these aspects of velociferous tendencies in Europe at that time, posing a threat to a humane language and way of living, eventually leading to the self-destruction of the hero in Goethe's drama, Faust. But before Goethe's poetical emigration to the non-velociferous world of Islam, he had discovered an early advocate for the concept of slowness and deceleration in Europe. Goethe unexpectedly came across some texts of the Dutch philosopher Baruch de, Spino de Spinoza, 1632 until 1677. Spinoza's own biography, in itself conspicuously already 
reflects a tendency towards slow motion and deceleration. After his expulsion from the Jewish community at the age of 24, Spinoza was forced to leave Amsterdam, at that time already a center of restlessness, and went on to make a living in modesty from, from grinding optical lenses. In particular, Spinoza's ethic, ethic revealed a counterworld to Goethe's own impatience and a counterworld rejecting the overhasty tendencies and desires of his time. Above all, Goethe also regarded Spinoza's pantheistic concept of nature to be the great counter-movement to the restless European world of progress and its haste and future-oriented restless desires. Because according to Spinoza's pantheistic concept, it's only in nature that everything occurs inevitably and in perfection as nature comes from God. And it was this pantheistic concept which allowed, in Goethe's opinion, to cast repeatedly a positive Spinoza-like light on the prophet Muhammad. Because to Goethe, Islam, too, appeared to be the manifestation of an anti-velociferous concept due to its, its religion of, as Goethe said, quote, unconditional confidence and devotion to God's will, unquote. This positive opinion on Mohammed throws light on Goethe's early resistance to the discreditation of Mohammed in West Europe, Western Europe, which predominated in the 18th century in Europe, a determined advocate of this discreditation, the French philosopher Voltaire, highly admired, as you know, by Frederick the Great, had sent his tragedy Mahomet to this Prussian king, Frederick the Great, in December 1740. In his accompanying letter, he indig indignantly commented on the prophet with the words, Voltaire, I quote, that a camel dealer wants his fellow citizens to believe that he talks to the archangel Gabriel, this certainly is what nobody can excuse, unless superstition had extinguished in him all natural light." Unquote. Goethe, who translated Voltaire's Mahomet tragedy at the, his Duke's uh, request in Weimar in 1799, had a totally different opinion. Although he agreed with Voltaire's rejection of religious fundamentalism, he resolutely distanced himself from Voltaire's negative opinion about Mohammed. In his translation, Goethe therefore suppressed the inhumane final monologue in Voltaire's Mahomet and his favorable translation was staged in Weimar in January 1800. Goethe furthermore opposed this contemporary reception of Islam in Europe, which declared Muhammad to be a false prophet, for instance, as early as 1772 by beginning his own project of writing a biographical Mahomet drama 
in five acts. Goethe, by contrast, considered Mohammed, Mohammed, that was the, the, saying, the, the pronunciation at that time, Mohammed, to be the storm and drunk, the storm and stress ideal of a great, active, creative genius. In Goethe's own Mohammed drama, Goethe intended to make the prophet's fate his search for God. And when the prophet dies, in Goethe's own drama, the purity of the idea of his absolute, absolute devotion to God's will, tr will triumph. Unfortunately, however, only one prose scene has been preserved of Goethe's Mohammed project. In addition, a famous hymn that was published by Goethe in 1789 called Mahomet's Hymn, Mahomet's Gesang, has also survived. In this hymn, the prophet is glorified as the divine nature of a river carrying everything within it. Mohammed, in the metaphor of a giant river, appears in this hymn as an absolute ruler, irresistible, joyfully carrying the children to God, to their father's heart." Unquote. Concurrently, to this enthusiastically declared advocacy for Mohammed, Goethe begins a very personal dialogue with Islam, a dialogue already characterized by visionary views in regard to modern times, which we are about to approach only now. That's to say, Goethe was obviously already aware at that time of the danger of an inscrutable temporal and cultural schism between Islam and the impatiently accelerating Occident. Goethe, therefore, saw a strong necessity for both to enter into a dialogue with each other, already 200 years ago. But unfortunately, Goethe's own attempt to enter in such a dialogue, represented by his West Eastern Divan, this great poetic cycle with the explanatory notes and reflections for a better understanding of the Western Divan, totally failed. Even as late as the beginning of the 20th century, numerous copies of the first edition of this early attempt at establishing a West Eastern dialogue remained unsold at Goethe's publisher, Cotta. And unfortunately, even today, knowledge of this intercultural stroke of genius is limited to the esoteric circle of a few specialists of German studies. Although Goethe was not understood by his own nation, Goethe was, in any case, the precursor for something important by writing the West Eastern Divan. He prepared a conversational divan with Islam, pursuing a simple and simultaneously difficult strategy of dialogue. A dialogue based upon the conviction stated and explained by Goethe himself in his notes and reflections that the Quran was nothing less than the most important religious document, unquote, in the history of mankind next to the Bible. 
One result of this deep respect for the Orient was that Goethe consciously gave reason to the suspicion that he was a Muslim himself. And Goethe himself apparently lived in accordance with this since he stated, quote, if Islam means devoted to God, then all of us live and die as Muslims, unquote. Goethe by and by immersed himself deeply in the Islamic world by reading the Quran and Oriental poetry. Poetry translated, among others, by Heinrich von Dietz, the Orientalist scholar and Prussian ambassador to, in Constantinople, and by Josef von Hammer-Pokstal, the famous Austrian Orientalist, and I'm pleased that the Austrian ambassador is with us tonight, uh, and diplomat in the Orient. Before this, Goethe himself had already translated the sixth surah from a Latin edition of the Quran himself, and had done exercising an Arabic script. He had also taken part and this is really a stunning event, he had taken part in a Muslim service, religious service, when Bashkirian soldiers from Russia, at the time allies in the war against Napoleon, came to Weimar in 1814. According to Goethe, this service took place quote, in the lecture hall of our Protestant grammar school, where the surahs of the Quran are recited, unquote. On the other hand, Goethe's admiration for the Islamic world did not prevent him from also praising the pre-Islamic Bedouin poetry of the Mu'alakat and from defending this poetry. Goethe being well, well aware of Mohammed's denigration of poetry states, quote, Mohammed has forcefully claimed and declared not to be a poet but a prophet and consequently, his Quran has to be considered to be divine law and not a human book written for instruction or pleasure." Unquote. But Goethe nevertheless did not hesitate to consider the Quran with pleasure and therefore discovered, quote, fabulous and fairy tale-like, unquote, poetical qualities of the Quran. But at the same time, he declared that the Bible too was nothing other than, quote, the oldest collection of Oriental poetry, unquote. But as already mentioned, Goethe knew that the prophet prophet had declared not to be a poet. <laughs> Nevertheless, Goethe consciously made the great Persian poet Hafiz the center of attention in his West Eastern Divan, thereby demonstrating his praise and admiration for the medium of poetry, which is obvious because he was a poet himself. And Goethe, of course, knew that Hafiz, due to his twofold capacity of being both a Quran teacher and a poet, always must have risked to, to appear ambiguous and suspicious 
for orthodox Muslims. On the other hand, Goethe emphasizes Mohammed's claim to absolute truth contained in the Quran. In Goethe's notes and reflections on the better understanding of the West Eastern Divan, he concludes, quote, to briefly say as much as possible, one may find the entire content of the Quran summed up at the beginning of the second surah, where it says, in this book there is no doubt, unquote. Goethe indeed recognized the categorical diction of the Quran, and he records, quote, in regard to this content and purpose, the style of the Quran is rigid, great, and almost terrifying, in some places truly sublime. In this way, one wedge drives the other wedge, and nobody should be surprised by the great effectiveness of this book." Unquote. Most probably, this great effectiveness of the Quran is what leads Goethe to the disturbingly modern conclusion, quote, in the history of mankind, the truly real, singular, and most profound topic which comes before all others will always be the conflict between belief and disbelief." Unquote. But Mohammed's ban, on the other side, on drinking wine, for instance, did not at all please Goethe. However, despite his reservations, Goethe came to the conclusion that, quote, the Quran is attractive, amazing, and ultimately engenders admiration, unquote. In a conversation with Eckermann in 1827, Goethe revealed what fascinated him most profoundly about Mohammed's doctrine. Quote, that this philosophical system of the Muslims serves as an appropriate model to be applied to oneself or to others in order to find out on which level of spiritual virtue one really stands." Unquote. This spiritual virtue, which Goethe primarily associated with Islam, was an idea he already admired in Spinoza's pantheistic doctrine, which I mentioned already. That's to say, the inclination towards determinism, towards the belief in a fate predestined by God, or, as Goethe expressed it himself to Chancellor von Müller, quote, confidence and humility are the true, is the true basis of any better religion. Unquote. This insight brought about Goethe's decision to try, quote, to hold myself on to Islam, unquote, as he confessed in a letter addressed to the composer Zelter in Berlin. To what measure interpreted Islamic devotion to God as an everyday way of life can be seen from his categorical dictum in the West Eastern Divan. Goethe here says, quote, when fate afflicts, afflicts you, fate knows why. Fate wants you to follow. 
In this discussions, in his discussions with Eckermann, Goethe left no doubt that in his opinion Mohammed's doctrine was also highly practical and implementable. Quote, in order to give young people a solid religious basis, Muslims strengthen their conviction that nothing will happen to man other than what has long since been predestined by God, who guides everything. Therefore, they are well prepared to lead their life and are seldom in need of anything else." Unquote. To go to this remarkable confidence in the will of God contrasted sharply with the Western, what he called, imperative of fear. Unquote. And it is this imperative of fear which is the reason why Goethe's hero Faust, driven by his vociferous desires and ambitions, ends his life in blindness. Faust is struck with blindness due to his fearful, that's to say future, only future-oriented attitude which prevents him from being able to appreciate the divine glory of the present. Apart from this, from this aspect, it should be mentioned that Goethe's remarkable confidence in the will of God led to his own skepticism of the Western concept of man's free will. As already mentioned, Goethe admired Spinoza's pantheistic religious doctrine, quote, everything that is, is God, unquote. Consequently, for Goethe, this meant that even man's seemingly free will has its ultimate source in God. Goethe therefore considered the idea of free will as a possibly wrong concept, thus already anticipating, as you probably know, irritating evidence from modern neurosciences. Let me conclude by coming back to the Muslim service that Goethe attended in Weimar in 1814, where he prayed together with the Bashkirian soldiers from Russia. The motivation for this joint prayer originated in Goethe's own preference for a Spinoza-like mentality of slow motion and calmness of the Islamic world and his attraction to the anti vociferous religion of Islam. Besides this, Goethe expressed, and by kneeling down with the Bashkirian soldiers, an act of tolerance by taking part in this Muslim service. He did so in the sense of his own provocative definition of tolerance in Maxims and Reflections, quote, Goethe says, tolerance should only be a temporary attitude. It ultimately has to lead to recognition. To tolerate means to insult, unquote. On the other hand, by contrast, Goethe made an additional quite realistic remark concerning tolerance in his novel Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship. Quote, in daily life, 
almost nobody is really tolerant. Although one may allow others to live according to their nature and character, one is nevertheless inclined to exclude all those from all activities who have a different point of view from oneself." Unquote. These two ambig ambiguous and divergent remarks on tolerance should be kept in mind in order to better understand Goethe. Goethe considered thinking in, amb in, ambiguity, in ambiguities, in paradoxes, and in contradictions as the most sublime way to approach truth. Goethe's own ambiguous remarks on tolerance should be kept in mind also with regard to the fact that nowadays Muslims represent the majority of the population in more than 50 countries of the world. Six million Muslims live in the United States, five million in France, more than three million in Germany, two million in Great Britain, and around 700,000 in Italy and Spain. Incidentally, the Muslim religion has the fastest growing community by far in the world. With its following, with its following of 1.3 billion, this community is already the second largest religion after Christianity, which has 1.9 billion believers. The, demo, the demographic outlook predicts a Muslim century since every fourth new member of the human race will be Muslim by the end of the first quarter of this century. Goethe does not offer any solutions for the future, but it should be stressed that in the West Eastern Divan, Goethe leaves both the problematic and the positive aspects of the Occident and the Orient open for a mutual exchange in the spirit of tolerance, thus paving the way for a real divan of wise men. Goethe, considering a dialogue in this spirit, in this spirit to be, quote, more delicious than gold and light, unquote. It should be mentioned that the German philosopher Nietzsche once said that he would have given away, quote, entire truckloads full of fresh and most modern biographies, unquote, for a conversation of this kind with Goethe. But it was also Nietzsche who observed without any illusion that Goethe, quote, Goethe existed and still exists for just a few, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Ashkurukum Minkuli Kolbin.